it looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that that shocked me. They don't make people that that big. The way it moved, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. Hey, this is Dan from Cuba, New York, and you're listening to the best podcast in all the land, Sasquatch Chronicles. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you. Uh, We're going down to California and we're going to be chatting with uh, Dwayne. Dwayne is a member of the Hoopa tribe down there. And uh, growing up, his grandmother was very revered, very important member of the tribe. And she shared with him a lot of her knowledge that was kind of passed down to her. She would warn him not to go into this area uh, where he's going to be talking about his encounter tonight. It's called Bald Mountain. And it's not far from where Patterson and Gimlin uh, captured the video of Patty walking across the creek. Uh, If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Uh, Let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome Dwayne to the show. Uh, Dwayne, thanks for being here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and I know back in 2018, uh, you had a pretty scary encounter up there on Bald Mountain. If you would just kind of start from the very beginning, kind of what were you doing and and what happened? Yeah, so it was pretty much a late June back in 2018. We were we literally just got off work. We were pretty hot up there in the mountains. It's a lot cooler, so we decided because it was Friday that we would go camping up at this spot because they had been a couple times before. I have not my, uh, I had not personally. So I was like, you know what, let me go with you guys. I do remember uh, my grandmother telling me stories about that, like that area in general being hot for Bigfoot. That area is probably, I wanna say about 20 miles from the Patterson Giblin film that was shot. So it wasn't too far from there. When we got to the camping spot, it's this nice little spot that's literally located right off the side of a mountain road pull off right off crop right off the bridge pulls off nice little open spot with a creek the creek's right next to the side of the mountain with a lot of underbrush on the other side but it's a nice little creek where you can kind of uh, jump in go you know about five feet deep uh, about maybe i want to say like 12 feet wide we got there everything was normal we started making setting up camp and it was i believe i want to say about 7 30 8 o'clock as a desk a as dust came around, uh, we started hearing this knocking noise up up the creek a ways. And we didn't we didn't think anything of it at first, because at first we thought it was more or less a woodpecker because of the kind of noise it was making. But then I want to say after 
about 20 minutes or so of this happening, it started, the knocking started becoming slightly a little more aggressive. Like they sounded more like a wood on wood thing, like uh, just a bam, bam. And then you'd hear like a snap. And it was weird because right after this, everything kind of went quiet. And so it, it uh, disturbed my friend's mom a little bit to where she kind of felt a little uncomfortable. So we built up the fire pretty big and she had the lantern on. The rest of the night was pretty uneventful. We heard, you know, a little bit of like rustling or whatever, but it, it is the woods. So we always encounter bears or, you know, mountain lions or things like that. So we didn't really mind too much. I mean, we, we did have guns. We had, we had a, a shotgun. We had uh, another type of rifle, hunting rifle. We all turned in about 10 o'clock at night after uh, getting everything set up and putting everything in the truck. And as we went to sleep, so the tents, the way we had set up, we literally set up. Uh, my tent was like a six by 10. I'm six foot four, mind you. So I'm pretty tall and I can stand up in my tent without, you know, with barely ducking down. So I'm trying to give you like a high voice. And their tent was uh, like a family style tent. It was a lar lot larger, but it was right next to mine. And the fireplace was probably like maybe five to 10 feet. Uh, literally from both our tents. Well, I want to say it was about two, two thirty, three o'clock in the morning. Uh, we got woken up by this kind of rustling noise out, uh, out past the Creek area. And it was weird. Uh, it wasn't like a something coming in. It was more like a thud noise, kind of like, you know, like snapping branches kind of. So we ended up waking up and I didn't hear, I, like I, I couldn't go back to sleep. I was already kind of terrified. So I was laying there and I remember the fire, but you can see the flicker in the flame from the fire. They had just built it up and she, uh, my friend's mother wanted to keep the lantern going because she was super kind of scared. She was off put just by the noise or whatever. And I remember when we woke up, there was the smell and it smelled like dirty diapers and like garbage, like a musky odor. And it started it, it, at first it started, it smelled like uh, it wasn't very strong. And then it turned into more of like an, a more like pungent, you know, like really potent. You can smell it. And the lantern started to flicker as the light started dying. And I, I remember this vividly as the light went down, all you heard is doof, doof, doof. And then uh, my, my friend's mom or my friend's dad had put these little cans on like a string with rocks in them. So that way, if anything crossed it, it would make that, it would make like a little clanging noise. Well, it, it did when he, uh, when that lantern went down, you heard and then inside on the other side of the clamp. And I remember being so terrified because I didn't have a gun or anything in my tent. It was just me and they were all in the other tent. So it came over and I remember seeing the silhouette on the outside of my tent and it was large and it terrified me. And I did, I had a little bit of snacks in my tent. I ain't going to lie, you know, and I remember it grabbing at the top of my tent. And as I'm looking up, I can see like these vivid yellow eyes. And it's so weird because like the facial structure almost reminded me of a human, but it was like a lot larger, like more than bigger than Shaq, I would say, you know, because I'm six foot four and this sucker was bending down and like grabbed the top of my tent. And like almost like it wasn't like I wasn't even a rag doll inside there. Literally grabbed me, picked me up, and dropped me like that. I started screaming at this point because I was terrified. And as I was screaming, my friend's dad came out and he shot through. He literally shot the gun. It sounded like it went through the tent. And then like you heard it go boom, 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 boom. It took four steps to literally get from where it was throughout my tent into the creek and onto the other side. And it was so crazy. And I remember I was like, I was crying <laughs> about those. Part. Like I was terrified. Like we, we all got out and we like, we built the fire back up really big. And I remember I was like, well, I don't want to sleep here. I want to go home. I kept home. I like, I want to go home. I'm done. I, I don't want to stay out here anymore. And they, they were kind of on this thing to like, oh, you know, he's gone. It'll be whatever. But like, you can see the footprints. There were these giant footprints that were right by the creek bed. And I was like, no, that I don't mess with. I was like, I don't deal with that. I want to go home. And I remember as we were packing up to leave and we, because mind you, we didn't even roll our tents up. We literally just pulled the uh, poles out of our tent and literally threw everything in the back of the truck. And as we were doing that, 
you heard like the little this whooping sound and it sounded it, it was weird because it came from one side and then as we were getting into the truck you started hearing it from uh multiple sides like there were multiple of them and i remember that when we left we started pulling out the he uh we pulled back onto the bridge pulled over to the other side because you have to go back onto the side of where that creature went to to get out of there and so as we pulled out we the, literally the side of the truck got smashed by like a little looked like a basketball sized rock and like we got out of there i never went back they went back the next morning uh and they had seen some they had seen footprints and this gaff of hair that they had gotten i don't know what they did with it after that point but yeah i i never re refused to go back to the state to that area yeah i don't blame you man and for it to walk up and and pick you up while you're in a tent you know that's a different type of weight that is completely dead weight you're picking up it's like watching those nurses pick people up out of bed in hospitals i, I don't know how they do it i'm a big guy and i see some of these tiny little ladies picking these people up and i'm like man you know um but it's all dead weight i mean this thing picks you up and just drops you yeah so it literally grabbed me like i was a rag doll like i was nothing and mind you i'm a big dude and back then i was still a big dude i was I'm like 320 340 so i'm not like a small guy for it you know when it grabbed it like grabbed the side like the side of it so i kind of like slid to one side as it picked up and dropped like it was curious as to what what it was what do you make of that behavior? I mean, it, it's extremely ballsy and it, to come into the campsite and do that. What are your thoughts on that that behavior? I mean, what do you think was going on? Well, see, that's what I that's what I've been trying to figure out because I have also heard a couple more people here in the valley have that same experience being at that campsite. And I now that campsite, I believe, is not even like it was when I went there because people stopped staying there. Yeah, I wonder if it was like curiosity, you know, it, it's almost like it owned the place, you know, it walked over and was like, hey, what's what's going on here? Um, I have heard of accounts like that, though, where they are, it, to me, it seems very aggressive to walk in, pick up a tent. Obviously, it knew you were in there. Um, I want to ask you about the, the, the eyes, the yellow eyes that you describe as you're looking through the tent. Would you say that it was kind of eye shine from the fire or do you think the eyes were actually glowing? It was more of a glow and it was weird. Yeah, it had more of a glow. I, now, this is the part where I'm not really too positive because in my mind, it looked like it was glowing, but it could have been just the reflection from the actual fire on it. But the way my memory is like going off it, they were like glowing-ish yellow color. When it was bent over your tent, um, did it make any sort of vocalization or did you hear anything, you know, as you were looking up at these eyes? it did before it came into the campground it started it made like this deep gurgle not gurgle but this deep like growl like growly with its throat it was like really uh deep throat kind of like a i don't know how to even put it it's like a like a baritone style like sound coming out of its almost sound like it came out of its throat yeah i don't envy you at all what a very vulnerable position to be in you know in the tent this thing's picking you up um i know your grandmother knew this area well what did your grandmother um tell you about going into this area so my grandma told me that that area is really spiritual they make medicine up there that her grandma had told her that in that area you don't stay there after dark because of things that happen uh we have tales of what are called little people and they're like tricksters they'll you know try to get you to follow them and then literally teleport you into an area that you have no idea where you're at and literally make you lost so that's kind of what they're known for but then also they had started that year they had started logging above it to try to do fire mitigation my grandmother was telling me that that may have what started up to make it more territorial and aggressive because they were moving trees out of the um area behind the mountain and she always told me that those trees were like portals to them like they can go through those trees and be able to pretty much coming in and out of our plane because she talks about them like spirits like you know they're able to use these trees to teleport from one area to another and disappear with them 
You know, I had an eyewitness contact me from California, and he's a church driver, and he actually saw basically everything you just said is exactly what he saw, and I really wasn't sure what to make of it, um, but I've heard weird stuff before. I know even the uh, two brothers that I always talk about, and I kind of wish I could go back in time and ask them, but one of the brothers said... Um, you know, that there's something about the trees and these creatures, and he kind of started going into it, and then he changed the subject, and we started talking about something else. You know, what's crazy is that same area, my grandfather actually had spotted Bigfoot back in 19, was in 1943, was the year he, and it was literally about four miles east of where we were camping. Him and his brother were, um, because it's an area called Bald Hill, and at the time they were doing logging in that area and he had those uh real old old osmobile kind of rides with those big windows and he had pictures of it i don't know where does what his wife did with him but he had pictures of him of these handprints on the windshield on the window because he said that these uh this big old ape-like thing stood bent down and looked in his window when he was uh, up there hunting when they decided to go to sleep in the car he said he never, ever forgot that. It was the first encounter he had with Bigfoot. Yeah, that's crazy, man. I love historical accounts. You know, your grandfather back in the 40s. Um, can I ask you, you know, your grandmother shared a lot with you. What's kind of the hoop of belief as far as what these creatures are? Yeah, so each, um, so here in our, in our, our tribe, we have villages, and each village has a different story on where, Bigfoot came from. Our story is that he was called upon. Uh, he was a spirit from another realm that our people had called upon to help us hide from when the, excuse my language, I don't know how else to say, when the pilgrims or whatever, when they came over, uh, our people were hiding from them. And so they called on Bigfoot to help hide in the trees and hide, you know, be able to hide our people. So that's one story I heard. And then another story was that they have, um, they were, revered as gods kind of in our tribe too, to where they gave them sacrifices. They had to give them food or they would come in and steal women and babies. And they said that they would come and eat them. And so they had to leave these uh, tributes out for them. So that way it wouldn't anger them. And there were areas and there still are, there are areas that we don't go to as uh, Hoopa tribal people because we know that those areas are no, what we call no man's land. Yeah, I'm curious about your own opinion. You know, when I think of something being spiritual, I think of something, um, you know, in the spirit realm, not really necessarily something physical. In the physical realm, uh, I don't really think of it uh, on a spiritual level. What's weird about Sasquatch is they seem to do all these weird things that people report that I would say are more on a, a spiritual level. But they're very physical in the same breath. People are running into them. They're terrified. They're not running into ghosts. They're running into giants. And and it terrifies people. And then they leave a trace evidence that they were there. You know, footprints, audio, uh, video pictures, that sort of thing. Uh, but then you hear about, like, eyes glowing and uh, just a lot of really bizarre things. What's your own personal opinion? I, I feel like they're meta metaphysical beings kind of i do believe that they exist in our our plane of reality and also the other plane of reality um you know the spiritual side of it because i do know that like um for instance when they had that finding bigfoot uh tv show people come up here to hoopa when i had sent them to the area that i was telling you about their camera equipment and all their stuff started dying on them like all their energy drained out of their batteries it was the most insane thing to see they had to literally come right back down the hill because they had no they said that their trucks were messing up their cameras batteries were dead their mics died and then they're like oh their odometer readers or whatever they had would like malfunction and i remember my grandma always telling me that uh it always gives off like i'm like electromagnetic things, she said, but she didn't use that word. She was more like spiritual energy. She always told me that that's how he would evade too, is he would know whether there was a game cam or whatever by the uh, physical energy that was around it. 
Yeah, it's weird. It, that happens in a lot of ghost encounters, too. You watch these people go out and their cameras die. Their equipment is dead. Um, very, very strange. You know, it makes me wonder if uh, if it is a spiritual being. And while they're in our reality, they have to play by certain rules. Um, I, You know, I've had people who claim to have shot them. And I believe that they've shot them. Um, what's weird is with, uh, like, this dogman creature... It seems to be bulletproof, unlike Sasquatch. Yeah, well, there's been encounters, too, where hunters up here, because we do a lot of stuff in the mount- some, some of the mountains at night, you know, because that's when we'll uh, gather uh, mushrooms and stuff like that, uh, called tannic mushrooms. And we, we go out at night because sometimes they're easier to see. And there was a story that literally, I think, happened last summer where they uh one of my friends said that he was up there doing it and he had seen something up there on top of the mount on top of the hillside so he literally said he shot it and the thing literally stood like it didn't like it didn't even phase it and it turned around and walked off i said it terrified my friend of the core he said he don't know if it was bigfoot or what he said all he seen all he seen was just this giant shadow up there and so he shot at it not knowing, not not knowing what it was, and he said that the thing did acted like it didn't even phase it and just turned around and walked off, like it was looking at what it was doing. You know what my buddy was doing up there. Yeah, I often wonder sometimes because I do believe all of this is being covered up, and I often wonder, you know, the the main reason to cover things up, as far as the U.S. government is concerned is to find a way to weaponize something, and it makes me wonder if they're trying to find a way to weaponize. You know, if they're able to access these abilities, it's hard to say. A lot of people run into this creature, and we call it Dogman. I hate that term. I don't know what else to call it. I guess werewolf. Uh, But do the Hoopa talk about this Dogman creature? I know the Navajos, um, you know, sometimes they'll talk about it being more of a skinwalker, but that's not really what the Hoopas believe. Um, Do they talk about this Dogman? So in our culture, they're not known as dogmen. They're known as what we call Putawans, Putawan. And it's, uh, it, they're called engine devils. We call them engine devils. And what they are are half man. They're a soul from a human that has acquired dark or black magic, as we call it, you know, and are able to shift themselves into these creatures. And what we do, what we, we have, we don't use sage or anything in our prayers. We use um, a root as part of our prayer when we do it and our smoke stuff. So we don't use the sage and we use root on the outsides of our homes. When, when these things come around, there's a big story going around here in Hoopa. Uh, not a lot of people like to talk about of an old engine devil. His name was Doc P and he used to turn into a dog and would terrorize people back from like literally 1960s to the 1990s would terrify people walking around the streets. They would see him and then they'd turn around and then they'd see a dog and then they'd see him down the road in front of them. Like he teleported in front of them wearing the dog's fur on as a coat. So, there, you know, there's some real terrifying stories that go. They also have a story too. And it's weird too, because they include Bigfoot. They, uh, they say that there's uh, the engine man that he ta- he helps Bigfoot take souls. And it's a weird story my uncle used to always tell us is that he um, brought Bigfoot here to help bring uh, to help bring souls back to the other side that are, are no good or that are broken, as they call it. They're native terms, but I, I don't know how to pronounce them well. Um, but they would literally bring these souls and they look like and it's weird uh, my cousin literally has a story about it she sees these cars that'll go with a man that has no face and there's a car that has no tires but drives and there are missing people that missing here in our valley that have been shown seen inside the back of the car like sitting in the back seat like the car is driving with no tires on it mind you and these people went missing in the woods yeah, that's scary, man. You know, seeing a ghost car and the people who actually went missing, uh, I wouldn't even know how to process something like that. Um, you know, with this dogman creature, 
Um, it, there's a lot of correlations between the way it behaves and poltergeist encounters. When you get into like demons and uh, poltergeists, they seem to really enjoy terrifying and terrorizing people. And the Dogman is very much the same. Uh, it seems to really enjoy terrorizing people, and it seems like there's nothing good of it. I thought as if there are nothing good about them. They're they're kind of soul suckers. <laughs> Um, unfortunately I had a really bad experience with them. Um, right after my grandmother passed and, or not my grandma, my grandfather passed, unfortunately, after attending his funeral, uh, we went back to the home and I got into this kind of little depression and I couldn't understand why. Well, during that time I got into like the travel channel and I got into like those TV shows called a haunting and stuff. And I remember going to sleep one night after watching one of these shows and I woke up to this man standing at the front, like front of my bed with a burned face. And I remember screaming terrified and my brother and my mother who I was staying with at the time had come running into the room and they had both seen this figure standing at the bed at foot of my bed that would turn around and walk through the door or walk through the wall, mind you. And so my brother ran out run around the house with his gun and literally seen the figure walk into the woods and disappear like dissipate like smoke and we had to literally burn we burnt root we did um we had to pray for the whole home and after that it went away but it was one of the most terrifying experiences in my life besides the other one yeah that's terrifying man that's really terrifying i'm not a big fan of stuff like that because i can't put a bullet in it <laughs> you know what i mean um, I, one question I want to ask you, I had a gentleman on the show one time, you know, we were just talking about the trees and, and that sort of thing. And there's a portion of the account he kind of left out because he was like, Hey, this is crazy enough. And, uh, I, I don't want to tell the, you know, I, I kind of want to leave this, this portion out, but I'll tell you what happened. Um, so he's a long haul truck driver and I believe he was in Arizona and wanted to get out of the truck, stretch his legs, get some exercise. And he found this trail to go down and probably a hundred yards, maybe 150 yards uh, in front of him is two women already walking down the trail. And what caught his attention is off to the left of the trail, uh, there's kind of a big tree. And he said it was like a flash, almost like a camera flash. I mean, it wasn't blinding or anything. I mean, he's pretty far away from it, but it caught his attention. He turned his direction that way. What he said came out of that weird little flash from the tree, it actually dropped out of the tree, was uh, an ape. And then another one came out and it appeared to be a werewolf. And he said they were absolutely communicating. Uh, he has a picture of this, by the way. And when you zoom in on the picture, it looks like a freaking werewolf in it and this huge ape standing there. Um, and he said that they were absolutely communicating. He said the Sasquatch appeared to be verbally communicating. He said this other entity was more hand gestures is what it was doing. Uh, but, you know, in a lot of encounters, you only hear generally hear about Sasquatch or Dogman. Rarely do you ever hear them together. And in this case, it sounded like they were on the same team. Yeah, like here in native country, you'll you you'll hear a lot of stories like that to where you'll hear them working together or working side by side necessarily, you know, and it, it, it's really weird to really think about uh, how they would how they would work together and pretty much communicate on a metaphysical plane you know he probably would have gotten a lot, like really hurt if it was just them was it nighttime that that, that, that is a that is crazy story oh no this is in broad daylight he took this picture like in the middle of the day and when he first sent it to me i noticed the women down the trail because he did kind of a panoramic view or panoramic shot of it and i just quickly glanced at it and when i talked to him he's like see that tree off to the left and then immediately when i saw it i was like holy crap they're standing right there um i mean it it i mean it, it's better than a blob squatch i'll give him that and if it's true they're working together, then Sasquatch is no better than Dogman. It's weird too because every tribe you go to, they they have different encounters. So I was I brought it up earlier was my friends up in Alaska. Theirs is called Nunoctum, and their their stories are that it's it's an evil creature. They fear it, 
and they literally have to keep um stuff on their homes in their like in their belief system in their tribe otherwise they'll it'll kill them they have areas they say that are completely no man they have posters and everything that say please don't enter this area yeah it kind of sounds like the same thing you guys do with um sasquatch you know leaving the tribute so they don't eat your women and children um, it kind of sounds like the same the same type of uh, storyline along all of these cryptids. I know there's some people out there will freak out that I said that, but you know words matter, and you know you'll hear people go, "Well, I got a gifting stump, and I leave gifts for this thing." Replace gifting stump with you're leaving a tribute. Now it has a whole different meaning to what you're doing. And I think a lot of people are playing with fire. That's my own personal opinion. You know, who cares what I think? But um, I think a lot of people are playing with fire with this whole giving tributes or quote unquote gifting stumps. You know, most tribes I talk to, they never really have anything good to say about this dog man. And when you say it takes some, um, uh, you know, it's a part part of your soul. Um, everyone who has an encounter with Sasquatch, Dogman, or any of these weird cryptids, it does take something from you. I want to ask your own personal opinion. What do you think Sasquatch is? My personal opinion is I feel like they are the next evolution of human, kind of. Like, instead of how we humans evolved into what we are now, pretty much, you know. they. I feel like they're like sort of like Neanderthal-ish kind of, you know, and grew into that area, but wanted no contact with humans. But on the same time, I feel like if it were like that, it would be like those tribes over, you know, in India that are in the ocean that, you know, have no human contact or the ones in the Amazon. It would be like that, not more or less all over the world where you're only seeing them, you know, in different spots and different angles. So that's why I'm like, I feel like it, you know, it did evolve from a human, but then turned to more or less superstition. And then I also have like a belief that it was because everyone started, you know, it started from one story. And then because so many people started believing and fearing, it created and manifested itself. And then now, be, due to the amount of people that actually believe in it, it actually created, you know, and I don't know, that's, that's kind of how I believe it. Yeah, and I get where you're going with it, Dwayne. I understand completely what you're saying, you know, manifest or willing things into existence. And I do think uh, sightings are ramp ramping up. And maybe it's because I, you know, I swim in this soup. But I think more and more people are having more and more encounters with bizarre things out there. And I know a lot of Native American tribes, they have a belief that when Sasquatch is uncovered, the end of the world's going to come. Does your tribe, do the Hoopas believe anything like that? I actually have, yeah. I've heard that when when all of the spiritual spiritual creatures, little people, uh, engine devils, Bigfoot, Nana, uh, or Kamos, like all these creatures, I feel like they will manifest themselves. And that's kind of the same way our, uh, our tribe believes, but we don't believe it as the end. We believe it as the great restart as well is what prophecy has told us so kind of uh more of a reset why a reset i mean what is it about these creatures that would cause a reset i mean what what's kind of your take on it i believe it's a reset because i feel like when we get to that point it'll pretty much be a reset for humanity sort of like how it did when you know our earth was connected and um in our our creation story was we we came from the mountains, but the mountains had the animals and the animals communicated with each other, you know, and they had done things together as community, the animals. And I feel like that's kind of where their end started to then where we start. So then now when we get to the end point, pretty much the, you know, end of all, whatever, that's what we call a great restart, because in that I feel like we'll enter into a new era of humans non-human you know entity things pretty much having to coexist and live because i feel like now like even now we can see it you know humans are encroding into more native habitats that they weren't before you know and so i mean yeah the united states is still covered by 50 percent of wild you know of national parks and whatnot 
but that also that number is, you know, it's shrinking as well as human population grows. And so it's pushing them out of their area and into ours. Yeah, the world's been reset uh, before, I believe, anyway. Uh, do the Hoopas have a, uh, a flood story? Uh, the, like a great flood story? Yeah, like a global flood story. I know in a lot of different tribes, you get to like the Apaches down to the Cherokee and all these different tribes, they have a global flood story. They don't call it Noah and, and the Ark. They have a different name for it. But a lot of these Native American cultures, they do have a Noah story. They just call them something else. And, uh, you know, I'm convinced that the, there was some sort of global flood. And I've looked into it, trying to disprove it, trying to show it was all BS. And I'm not so sure it was BS. Um, but, yeah, do the Hoopas have any anything like that, like a global flood story? There is, yeah. So we, we did. And uh, the way our storyteller, storytellers told us is that we climbed the great tree, uh, the grandmother tree, that it's no longer here, but that's what they had used to crawl. They lived in this tree for, I believe it was like four seasons in the story uh, that was told to us. So when the great flood happened, it, they had to climb the tree and only so many few survived out of that tree. And then that's what became the tribes of where we are today. Yeah, I've heard that account before. I don't think it was from the Hoopa tribe, but I've heard that account before of the tree. Uh, do they go into a reason why there was a global flood? No, unfortunately, they did not. I do remember back in the 90s, it was they had a cave over there uh, in Lake County, not Lake County. I'm sorry. I apologize. Not, uh, Shasta County. And they found whale bones in there. And whale bones that dated back almost a thousand some years, or well, yeah, a little over a thousand years, almost. And they couldn't figure out, they couldn't figure out how the whale bones got in there into that cave, unless the ocean water was that high. And mind you, the cave was up on the other side of the Mount Saint Helen, or not Mount Saint Helen, sorry, Mount Shasta. That's really cool. I'm gonna have to look into that, man. Um, and I hope this is more. I hope this doesn't feel like an interrogation. I'm just excited to uh, chat with you and. I'm I'm fascinated by other people's beliefs and, um, you know, when you're in this for a long time and you hear a, many different things, many different encounters, many different experiences, uh, it's eye-opening to hear some of these other beliefs and go, I, I don't think they're wrong when they say that. So forgive me if, if I'm coming across like, <laughs> like this is an interrogation. Yeah, not at all. I, li I love talking about this stuff, so yeah. I'm all for it. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about the little people. Um, I've probably had maybe a dozen people come forward. It's very, very, it's a low percentage of people who see the little people, uh, but people do see them. And I'm talking about non-natives. Uh, you know, I've had hunters who've seen, run into them. I've had hikers who've run into them. And most people, when they run into them, they'll say it reminded them of a, a, a little person, like a like a Native American. I know in um, Canada, the First Nation people, they have a belief in a being called the Buckwas. And it's kind of more like a, a small version of Sasquatch, but it seems to behave more like the little people. It's weird, though, man. When people see these little people, they'll describe them as like little Native Americans. It's, it's bizarre. Little humans. You look on YouTube, there is actually a beautiful video that was taken over on the islands in the East, East India islands, I believe that they had caught one on, on video. And it's um, so perfect to see because th that same video, I just showed it to a couple family members that had encounters with little people. The only thing with our little people is they have power. So what I mean by that is one little person can be fire. One little person can be ice. One little person can be dirt, water, earth kind of like the elements of an avatar it's the way i can describe it in our tribe is they have they each have abilities to manipulate that to whichever they're in yeah that's the thing with the little people everyone i've ever talked to they'll go i don't know what to tell you man it was like a little human being and it was fast like lightning and but it was very physical it was not like a ghost or something like that the the video you're talking about is that the one where they're on the bikes on the dirt bikes i believe 
and this little tiny person comes running out of the bushes and takes off and they caught it on their uh, GoPro. Yeah. Yes, that one. That same thing has been seen over here too in our valley. It has multiple, multiple people have uh, have a lot of stories of little people because they run rampant around here in our area. Yeah, it, what's weird is, um, and forgive me for this, but I, you know, I, I guess it's kind of like Dogman. Uh, when it's here, it, it's very physical. Yeah, because they have the ability to teleport right out of the flu. My grandmother used to always tell me that the trees are um, the eyes and windows of the soul to the earth. They can pretty much go to any point in time, which is which would be backwards or forwards, however they want, and that those those beings, Bigfoot, little people, they use that to pretty much go in and out of our reality, in and out of our time. Yeah, it's very strange. I want to go back to believing it was nothing more than just an ape out there running around. I want to take the blue pill again and go back to thinking this is some great ape out there. I just have my doubts on that. There's too many weird things that go on with Sasquatch, and too many people look the other way because they want it to be a great ape. Great ape's eyes don't glow. Therefore, the eyewitness must be wrong. Great apes don't disappear. Therefore, the eyewitness must be wrong. Uh, great apes' tracks don't disappear, you know, just magically vanish. Therefore, the witness must be wrong. Maybe the witness isn't wrong. You know, I mean, maybe there there's so many bizarre things and people are consistent when they tell you. I, if you're not really searching for answers, then what are you doing here, you know? I want to ask you about that bald hill that you went to where you had the encounter with the tent. Uh, would you ever go back there? You know, I've been thinking about it a lot lately of actually going back and really just seeing what I can find. But at the same time, I'm kind of like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> like, it still puts the fear in me, you know. Like, I've even been up in the mountains by myself at dark and have not seen anything. It, but at the same time, like, even my coworker a few weeks ago had a Bigfoot encounter banging on some um, drums down there about 100 feet from her home. Or not drums, but banging on a um, gas, those uh, gas tanks, those uh, propane tanks. Do the Hoopas believe in your culture that these creatures have a language? Uh, because, you know, sometimes I'll talk to Native Americans and they'll say, well, it was speaking, speaking to me in my native tongue. I've also talked to non-Natives and they'll, they'll say, yeah, what I heard was English or what I heard was Spanish. Um, do the Hoopas have that belief that you can communicate with these creatures? Absolutely. So in our, our uh, culture, Bigfoot is known as a mentalist. They can actually speak to you by using their their mouth and or they can speak to you using pretty much the psychic ability by looking at you, eye contact. By create by connecting the eyes in our culture is if you connect eyes, you can connect pretty much soul to soul and be able to communicate that way. And they use that as a way of manipulation and use it as a way of control. Because in our in our culture, Bigfoot is known as a controller. He controls people that he takes a part of them pretty much when he, he looks into people's eyes with the glow, the yellow glow. And that's why I tell you, I couldn't I couldn't differentiate between whether it was the light from the fire or whether his eyes were yellow glowing, because in my mind, that's what I had seen is the eyes. The eyes were still what pierced me to this day. I can still see those eyeballs. Yeah. And, and you hear a lot of uh, like researchers and investigators go, well, you, you don't look at them in the eyes because when you look at a great ape in the eyes, it pisses them off. You know, any primate does not like to be looked in the eyes. And it, it, I don't think that's it. I really I, I think you're close. You know what the Hoopas believe is way closer because I've had so many eyewitnesses on that feel like they can't break that stare. They can't it's like they're locked into it. They're frozen. Um, do you think the Sasquatch is an evil entity? No, not at all. I I mean, yeah, I do feel like there are some that, you know, that are evil, that are Bigfoot, but I feel like a majority of them are pass, not, I don't want to say passive aggressive, but, um, you know, they just pretty much want to be left be pretty much. 
but I know that they are very, very territorial. I do know that. They seem to be so. W would you ever want to see one again? Absolutely. So I actually, uh, like I said, I've been going up in the mountains um, to different spots to see, but I, uh, in the spots that I go to, I try to go into areas that I know uh, aren't going to be a sacred areas that we're told not to go because when in those areas that's where you encounter the aggressive bigfoot my grandma used to always say that the male bigfoot are more aggressive and dominant than the females yeah kind of the last question i want to ask you um in your culture and the hoopas do they ever talk about these weird structures people find in the woods um, do they ever go into, hey, if you see this, then do this, you know, as far as these weird structures people are finding? Yeah, so my grandma used to always tell us that if you are in the woods and you encounter um, the wooden X's, which are uh, trees that have been broken off halfway and they're bent in more of an X shape, that those are no man land. That's where that's where Bigfoot has created his territory or if you're in the woods and you come across mounds like four or five inch mounds on in the uh, woods you stay away from those because those are little people homes and little people portals our tribe is also like if you have an encounter with bigfoot you pretty much want to get um prayed over and you pretty much want to have a uh, root burned over you to break that connection between you and bigfoot like navajo and apache and all them burn sage to ward off evil spirits we use a root. Uh, it's a very specific root. It's found in literally only four spots here in Northern California. Um, we use it, though, because it does the same thing for us in our culture. If it wards off spirits and it wards off evildoer. You know, you and I were talking about while while they're here, they're physical. I'm assuming it's a big no, no to shoot one. Yeah, so in our culture, if you shoot one, you're going to antagonize the family of it and they will come and they will attack because we so in our culture, too, they're known. So my grandmother there used to always tell us that and my grandmother is a medicine muscle, mind you. So she heard her stories. Uh, we, I come from a very strong dance family and then she had a lot of stories. And in one of her stories, she used to always tell us Bigfoot bury their dead like humans do. That's why you don't ever come across bones or anything like that. And they, it's crazy because she always used to tell us that bit, the way Bigfoot bury their dead, they bury them on top of each other. Unfortunately, yeah, I never really got around to ask. When I, when I really started getting into this, unfortunately, my grandmother passed away when I started getting into all this, other, like all the superstition and stuff like that. So I never really got to ask her. And um, unfortunately, my uncles and stuff are gone now, so I'm not able to ask them neither. Yeah, well, God rest your grandmother's soul, and uh, thank you so much, Dwayne, for coming on and putting up with my my interrogation. I really hope it didn't come across that way. I just had so many questions, and um, I, it was an honor to have you on, man. Thank you again. Yeah, absolutely. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance to go to sasquatchchronicles.com, you can become a member and get additional shows. Until next time, everyone. Bye.